Welcome to the Portland Pentecostals podcast. We're happy you've decided to join us as we build a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. Enjoy the message. And uh, we are concluding a series of lessons on words, words that heal and words that kill. And uh, in doing so, we're going to finalize this. And uh, this is a very important series, I feel, uh, to you and I, uh, to every individual. And even those that are not believers can follow these principles, and it will be beneficial to them. The beauty of, of the Word of God is that if we follow the principles of God's Word, they will work. Now, I'm not telling anybody to cop out on God on one or more principles that he has in his word. But I remember when my father uh, told me years ago uh, that he, uh, he, he started paying tithe before he was saved. Now, part of the reason he might have done it is he was a preacher's kid and he knew what it was like when they starved. <laughs> but uh, he, he wasn't saved, and my mom was going to church, and so my dad would give, and I said, why did you give? And he says, this is not going to sound good, but I knew God would bless my finances if I gave. And so he learned to enact that principle, and God blessed his finances, and that doesn't mean he was going to heaven, but the principle works. And so you and I can have principles that we're following, and we can see that come back to us in the kingdom of God and in our lives and still be lost. Or we can be saved, and there's other principles that we're not quite applying, and so we're not getting the full benefit of the kingdom of God because we're not following all of his principles. And I have found in my life, as many of the principles that I've learned to follow, I still have to work on them. Or I find myself slipping out of a good habit or slipping back into a bad habit and I need the word of God. I need fellowship with you. I need worship in his presence. I need my personal devotions to get me back on track with regularity. I think all of those things are very, very important. And so what we're going to do is just a little bit of review tonight before we start into uh, the act of keeping our, our bucket full. We talked about filling one another's buckets or filling other people's buckets uh, uh, last week. And we're going to give, rehearse five strategies for success that we would use. Is First of all, is prevent bucket dipping. In other words, if you want to keep somebody else's bucket full, uh, don't dip into their bucket. Don't speak negatively in their life. Don't be hypercritical of their life. Don't be the, the, the person that just reaches in and is always taking some of their reserve away. And you know what empties particular people's buckets. We're, we're not dumb. It's like, you know when you're taken out of your bu their bucket. And if you don't know right away, you can see the after effects sometimes. Maybe they're discouraged or they want to avoid eye contact with you or you, they want to avoid you altogether. And you're thinking, why is that? And maybe it's nothing to do with them, but maybe they don't feel encouraged when they walk away from you. The second principle is to make best friends. And we spoke about this last week is that uh, guys can have best friends and they can have 10 and girls can have one, it seems. But uh, what we mean by best friends is people that you can share your heart with. Uh, I, I fought the most with my younger brother when we were growing up, but he's my best friend now. Ever had that happen? Guys can do that, you know. Guys can have a knockdown drag out. And then you know each other's boundaries and you say, cool, I like you. <laughs> and there were guys that I kind of had it out with in, in grade school and then we became buddies and then we went to different middle schools and when we got back together in high school, it was like instant. Why? Because we, we knew each other's boundaries. Now, I'm not encouraging you to fight with everybody to see if you can become their best friend. That's not... <laughs> A good strategy. But best friends are people that know our limits. They know our joys and our sadnesses. And uh, I, I would say this is that if you want to know who can be your best friend, tell them something that's, that everybody else doesn't know that's not important and see if it gets out. And if it gets out, then they're probably not a candidate for your best friend. 
because they've got to be able to keep private things private. And there's secrets in private, and there's two different issues with that. Uh, so we have private conversations that we just don't want everybody to share. I have come, uh, and, and this is another lesson uh, when we talk about gossip uh, someday, is that I've come to understand that your story is your story, not my story. And I'm going to leave that story for your, you to tell. So sometimes, some of you have come into my office and you've said, I, I need help. I'm going to tell this. And I said, now I want you to know this is not my story. It's your story. So I'm not going to go tell your story. But if you want to tell everybody else your story, you're welcome to tell your story. And some people have said, yes, this is my story. But I think it's a story you can share that will help others. And I'll say, okay. You've said that, and I'm still a little hesitant sometimes to share those stories because they're not my stories. But making that best friend, by that we mean somebody that you can bond with and you can trust with your deepest secrets and your, and your uh, worst fears. And then give unexpected, unexpectedly into people's lives. Just uh, be, be kind to them. Give them something uh, that... Uh, they're not expecting. Uh, I, I saw it underneath my door. Somebody sent a $20 gift card and I did thank them for it. Uh, and it's like totally unexpected. But it's like, okay, that feels good. Somebody really does care about me. And then the fourth one was uh, reverse the golden rule. In other words, it's not do unto others as you would have them do unto you, but do unto others as they would have you do unto them. So that takes a little more forethought. That takes a little more concentration because then it's not about me, it's about you. And uh, in relationships, all relationships, say boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, siblings, friends, there are things that feed us that don't feed the other partner in the friendship. And so we've got to learn that dance and not be always the one that's just taken. And you're my friend because I can use you but we're friends because we help one another. And if we're really truly friends, we find out how to bolster that friendship and, and, and share that friendship. And the fifth one and the final one is shine a light on what is right. And, I, and uh, I'm going to read to you out of a book that I've been reading out of, and I got a lot of these illustrations out of. And, uh, and this is what the psychologist says. This is a friend of ours recently discovered the power of focusing on what is right. Unhappy in her marriage, she had been after her husband for weeks to make changes. He didn't seem interested in spending much time with her, and when she complained, he got defensive and spent even less time with her. So she drew, upon, drew even more attention to those things that upset her, hoping he would notice, and instead she found that the things seemed to get worse. Realizing that telling her husband how much he disappointed her wasn't working, she tried to an experiment and she began to draw attention to the things that he did well and what she did like about him. She was skeptical, but she had nothing to lose. And what do you think happened? After several days, her husband was happier when he came home and more engaged in the relationship. Eventually, his attentiveness and warmth began to fill her bucket, just as her positive outlook toward him had filled his. But then this is what the interesting part is. But the most unexpected thing that she felt was she felt happier on her own by focusing on the positive rather than dwelling on the negative. And this in turn caused her to be much more positive in her interactions with other people. After a few weeks, both she and her husband were passing this newfound energy along to friends and co-workers. So that's the fifth one, is shine a light is on what is right. And yes, we do need to deal with issues in our life, but we need to shine a light on what is right. And sometimes if we know we're doing all right, but we could do better, but people acknowledge what we're doing right, then it's going to be all right. God does that with me, with you with his words. You'll notice if you read his word, it is overwhelmingly positive. It is overwhelmingly strengthening. The stories that are there do tell the failures of others, but tell you and I that we don't have to fail in the same way if we'll have faith or if we'll avoid a certain thing. And what we need to try to do is build on what is positive rather than throw the negative against the wall and see if it will stick. So those are just some strategies we learned to help fill others' buckets. 
buckets. But now, tonight, we're going to get selfish, and we're going to talk about keeping your own bucket full. And in doing so, we're going to examine some things that you and I can take responsibility for. Uh, it's uh, Everything, if we're going to make progress, has a price. It's just like if we want God to forgive us, if we're already a born-again believer, we have to confess our sin for Him to be faithful and just and forgive us our sin. If we're not a born-again believer, we have to repent of our sin and turn away in order for Him to forgive our sins. Yes, baptism does save us, but God says, okay, yes, I've forgiven your sins, but you have to be baptized and I will wash away your sin. So there's a, a give and take. But that's normal in life, isn't it? You don't just sit on the edge of the bed and say, here's Saki Saki, and it just comes and gets on your foot. You can have a drawer full of socks, and they're worthless unless you pull a, pull a pair off and you slip them on. And sometimes they're worthless anyway if you don't wash them every once in a while. So... I gave you a scripture that we're going to read a couple of times tonight, and that is Psalm 19 and 14. And I told you that I pray this almost every day. It's not every day, but almost every day I pray this prayer. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Now, if you, did your, if you would happen to do research, uh, the psalm before is Psalm 18, and David starts out, this is the psalm of David to the chief musician after finding deliverance from all of his enemies and Saul. And so he talks about what God has done and how he's delivered him. And then he says, now let me talk about the positive things and think about the positive things, God. Uh, David had plenty of junk that happened in his life. You and I have plenty of junk that happens in our life. We have plenty of junk that happens in the world. And I have to monitor myself. I have to decide how much I'm going to let in of some stuff and what I'm just going to pretend it doesn't happen. This is what is always an interesting thing to me is when my wife and I go on vacation, if we go on a motorcycle ride, oftentimes we're in places we have zero cell phone service and it's wonderful. My wife and I, when we go away on our day off, usually we ignore our phones. Uh, we'll get on the bike and go over the mountain and I say, do you have your phone? She said, no, I left it at home. <laughs> and she, she, she's breathing still at the end of the day. I mean, not hyperventilating, but just breathing normally. Have you ever walked out of the house and forgot your phone and go, oh. yeah. we do that now, don't yeah. we? And it's like, come on, dudes. I used to be gone for hours, and my parents probably were going, they don't have that junk that can track me. If they did, I'd have been in trouble. I wouldn't have been driving very long. It's just like, but we survive without that stuff. But once we get used to information, we feel like we have to inf have that information. I read part of the memoirs of George W. Bush, and he said one of the most difficult things about not being a president is not being in the know. Right. That he didn't have the information that he had once had. Yes, he had top security clearance, but nobody was sharing the information with him. And that's oftentimes what happens is we leave a relationship or a responsibility. It's difficult for us because we just don't have the information. But we can do with some out, out some information in our life. And so two weeks ago, we read this passage of Scripture, Finally, brethren, and this is a way to keep our own buckets full. Whatever things are true, that's the baseline. And everything else that he says has to be referred back to the baseline. Whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. And you'll notice that whatever is true is in there, but that is qualified by everything else that comes after. It may be true, but not virtuous or noble of a good report. So you don't have to think on those things. You may have to process that information in life, and you may have to respond to that information, and you may have to share it with somebody else for their benefit or for the benefit of problem solving, but you don't have to think about it all the time. And the more we think about the negative, the more anxious we become about the future. And sometimes we can become anxious about our past because we're thinking about, oh no, condemnation, oh no, judgment, oh no, it's the end of the world. It's all going to catch up with me. But we have a choice. And so I have had to train myself to think on those positive things. And verse 9 is the beautiful part of it where it says, and the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace 
will be with you. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? That's a, a cause and effect. It says, if you'll think this way, the God of peace will be you, with you. If you don't, does that mean God is not with us? Well, God's with us, but not the God of peace because we're stirring the pot all the time. And we just can't quit thinking about those things and quit sharing those things. And that is very important. We can have peace in the middle of the storm. If we learn to focus on the right things, so here's the thing is we can focus on what we lost or we can focus on what we still have. We can focus on what we don't have or what we could have. We can focus on what we walked away from or we can focus on what we're pursuing. So we make those conscious decisions. And again, we said this, I think the first lesson is we have varying personalities. Some of us are Eeyores and you know, you know who Eeyore is, right? Winnie the Pooh in the Hundred Acre Wood. Oh, no. And some of us are ding, 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 Tigger. T-I-double-G-R. And, and it, it's kind of cool to watch uh, Christopher Robin and his interaction with his, his animal friends because it really does, it reveals a lot about humanity. The man that wrote that book is pretty smart. And he's doing it in a way where we can uh, overlay our personality on an animal so it doesn't sting quite as bad as it, it would if we were read it and our name was there and Steve did. Oh, no. <laughs> but it, 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 we transplant that and go, oh, okay. Okay, maybe I'm being Eeyore today. And I need to quit being Eeyore, uh, being so dour. Maybe I'm Tigger and I'm just so distracted that I'm not even paying attention to any of the details. And so you've got both extremes, right? Yeah. And, and we wrestle with that as humanity and we've got to calm ourselves down. That's why learning styles are different. That's why boys have easy time with some subjects and girls have easy time with their other subjects. That's why we need all kinds of stimuli in our life. But if we do our part and we think on these things and meditate on these things, that means it, when we spend constant time or, or focus time, it's on these things. And here's a saying that I saw recently is this, is that the very fact that Satan assaults us should fill our minds with hope. Yeah. Why? It means we're worth something. Somebody was saying to me the other day, and I can't remember who it is, so if you're here in this room tonight, I apologize, I can't remember who said this to me. They said, well, you know, if I'm being tempted, I guess that should say something. That should say that I must be heading in the right direction because why would he be tempting me if I'm, if I'm already lost, if I'm already fallen? And the Bible says he would deceive the very elect if it were possible. Now, the very elect, it might not be possible, but he's still trying. He's trying to find a chink in the armor. He's, he's, the, guy that's, he's the guy that's testing the equipment all the time. So here's the process that we need to do in order to make sure that we keep our bucket full. We used this same process last week for keeping others' buckets full. Stop, look, and listen. We pay attention to what we can do to make sure that we strengthen others, but now we've got to look and, and see, what is it that drug me down? Did I fill my bucket with something? Did, was it that negative news? Uh, did I, I dwell on that negative news? Uh, uh, is it that individual that I spent too much time with or made my best friend that maybe isn't going in the same direction that I am? And there are some people, you know, there's, there's Christian conspiracy theorists. So you hear that? There's Christian conspiracy theorists. Now, I would... It's not a Christian thing that the way they're doing, but it's everything is the devil. Everything. And I mentioned to you, and maybe I mentioned it to leadership, is that uh, I think it was in this class three weeks ago that I said, uh, Brother Paul Reynolds was a missionary in Jamaica, and there was a bishop there, and he used to say, if you, if you injured yourself, if you had an accident, there must be something wrong in your life, until he fell off the platform and broke his leg. <laughs> it, it's, 
everything is not a conspiracy. Some things are just life. Yeah. You know, I, the Lord, send the rain on the just and the unjust. And the rain can be good or bad, depends on how hard it is and when it comes. It says, but it just, time and chance happen to us all. It's just the way it is. And sometimes it's just good to accept that this is life in a fallen world. This is life among sinful people. And even if we're doing right, there is sin in the world and sin entered into the world. And all of those that are born of the seed of Adam have sin. That's just life. And so the world is not perfect. So stop, look, and listen. So we're going to apply this. So we need to prevent others from bucket dipping. That is your responsibility. So, number one, stop gossip. I could say stop gossiping, which would be correct, but I could say stop gossip. I have this simple little saying. I have to have simple sayings in order, you know, simple Simon type thing, is that if you're not a part of the problem or part of the solution, stay out. Now, this is a very interesting thing. As a pastor, a lot of things comes across my mind or into my view or people talk about, and, and, I, and it's my responsibility to guide the church. But here's the wild and wonderful thing is that I have, uh, there's another 45 churches in Oregon that I deal with those ministers and 110 ministers, and so a lot of information comes into my, my inbox if you please, whether it's by email or telephone or message or just I step it on it. I have to learn to stay out of what's not my junk. Do you know why? No, one thing is, is that say if somebody offends brother Eli, God will give his, him grace to deal with that offense. But if I make brother Eli's offense my offense, God doesn't have any responsibility to give me the grace to deal with Eli's offense, even though he's given me the grace to deal with mine. And so I'm taking all this baggage on that I, I, I can't process it. I'm going, why can't I process it? It's not yours, dummy. Yeah. I mean, that was a bad negative word. <laughs> but I have to look myself in the face in the mirror saw sometimes and say, stop. That is not yours. And I, and I go back to Sister Freeman saying, saying, talk about the good and pray about the bad. And so even in the gifts of the Spirit that we'll talk about, when I get information and I get a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge or the discerning of the spirits, it doesn't mean I, I don't go to the negative right away. You know, I could walk by a friend and I could feel the spirit of lust. And I could say, ooh, he's lusting. Or I could say, he's being tempted with lust. Hmm? And God's saying, pray for him. So we need to stop the gossip. So if we're not a part of the problem or part of the solution, then stay out. And, and I'm going to go back to this in just a, a minute. Turn negative conversations into positive conversations. And, I'm going to, and speak up. Counter the positive counter with positive, and finally, limit contact. I'm going to give you an illustration is that, do, do you know that pre preachers are flesh and blood, right? Do, do you know that? Whoa. Um, you have not seen my hair in the morning. A few of you have. It's Hanson hair. It's like, <coughs> like this. And it's like, I... I actually run a brush through my hair before I brush my teeth because I don't want to look at that in the mirror. <laughs> I'm just being honest with you. It's like, wow, that looks really, really bad. And it doesn't matter if I went to bed with product on or without product on. It's just like, it's just the way my hair is. And so uh, I look at myself and say, well, I, I need to take care of myself. But preachers could gossip. Saints can gossip, sinners can gossip, and everybody can. So I had this friend, and we used to spend hours together, and, and uh, I, I was shocked when he started gossiping about people. In other words, he was telling negative things about people that I just didn't need to know. I mean, it's just like, why'd you tell me that? Because I'm not a part of the problem or the part of the solution. I really didn't need to know that. So... 
I was young. He's twice my age. And I thought, what am I going to do? So I, I prayed about it. And then I was reading the word of God. And I thought, I know what I'm going to do. The next time he brings somebody's name up, I'm going to say, I really like him. And I remember distinctively a person's name being brought up, and I said, yeah, we had so much fun the last time they were at our house. And he'd go to somebody else and go to some, because we'd spend hours sometimes together and in tight quarters in a vehicle. And it's like, I love the guy, and he loved me, but I thought, we can be beneficial to each other, but I can't do this. It didn't take but about three weeks, and he didn't gossip to me ever again in the next four years. Why? Because I wasn't going to go there. I was going to turn a negative to a positive. And in other words, when you go through all the stop gossip, turn the negative conversation, speak up, counter with positive. Well, if I couldn't have changed that, then I would have had to limit contact. There's some people that you just can't afford. You know, you don't have to answer every phone call. We didn't used to. So we didn't have answering machines. If the phone rang and rang and rang and rang, somebody say, where were you last night? None of your business. How come you didn't answer the phone? No, no. The phone would ring, and we didn't even know it rang. We'd come home, and it's like, I remember running for the phone when it was ringing. Mom says, they'll call back. Why? Because we didn't have voicemail. We didn't have caller ID. We, I remember when caller ID was star six nine, you know, and you might get the last call that called, and it was like ten cents each time you did it. I think, like, man, I hated that. So you better really want to know who that person was. But you and I, this is preventing others from dipping into our bucket. Because I found when I was done with that communion with that individual what, that was so negative, I, I didn't feel good. I didn't feel edified. I didn't feel built up. And it's not all about me being built up, but it's about what's right. Whatever things are pure and good and lovely and honest. And, and if I get all that information in my mind, and I, I'll tell you what I have done also to help protect myself. I have prayed that God would help me forget some things that I know. And he has. Want to know what my middle name is? I don't remember. No, just kidding. <laughs> It's not that extreme, but there's actions that I've seen. And I say, God, wipe that from my memory. There's things that accidentally came into my view. And I go, God, I don't need that. So I don't dwell on that. I don't meditate on that. I meditate on the pure and the lovely and the good and the honest and the true. And that's what strengthens me. And there's always negative and positive going on in our world. So here's some tools that I use just for myself in order to... Sometimes I just am quiet, believe it or not. Silence. Sometimes shutting all the noise out. Sometimes driving down the road and you don't have music on. You're not listening to Fox News or whatever you listen to. There's no talk radio. It's just like quiet. Do you know what I found out? Sometimes I've missed God talking. He was talking, but there was too much other static in my life going on that I didn't hear my voice, his voice. When I pray, I have to learn to shut up because part of prayer time is listening. It's not like, blah, 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 blah. By God, see you tomorrow morning. And we walk out and he goes, Ksh. That wasn't communication. That's not what I, I don't need to just dump on God, but I need to commune with God. So silence can be a good thing. Another thing that I use is music. Now, my wife is much more into music than I am, but I, I monitor what kind of music comes into my life. And there is music that can lift me and strengthen me. And, and uh, that song that we sang song today, oh, no, how great. Oh, your works. That's been, that been, I've been waking up in the morning singing that and going, I'll declare your love in the morning. I didn't know the declare word. So, you know, one morning and finally said, what's that word? Who sings that? And she, 
What's the name of that song? I didn't know the name of the song because I just really didn't. I wasn't paying attention. I was just singing the song. Who cares what they named it? I know what I'm singing. Is that music does something to me. And sometimes it's the old rugged cross or something that I haven't sung since I was a little kid. That's a memory song that ignites the positive because that song comes into my mind and it comes from the time when I was first saved or it comes from a time when I had an amazing experience in the Holy Ghost and I remember those times. That, and those songs can bring back good things. They can bring back bad things too. So I am taking control of my life to make sure my bucket doesn't get emptied because you can go listen to every song by Brad. I found her diary underneath the tree or, hey, you know, if you saw the most beautiful girl in the world that walked out on me or Sally ran off with Randy or whatever it is. <laughs> you don't feel too good by the end of it. You know, I, I have Sirius XM radio. There's an ad that's been on recently, and it's like, wow, wow, you're tired of country music and this and this and this? Listen to our happy country music station. <laughs> I didn't know there was happy country music, but, <laughs> but it's important. The spoken and the written word, and by that I mean the word of God, is very important. There are a lot of good podcasts out there. There are, uh, I, again, today, I was teach, teaching, getting ready to teach this lesson. I listened to Psalm 18 and Psalm 19, and I'm listening to it on Bible.is, which is an app that I have, and I'm listening to it read in the English Standard and the NIV and a woman's voice and a man's voice and an English voice and a Nazi voice, and, you know, and I, I'm just... It's a different way of getting the word into my mind so that it has a chance of getting into my heart. And, and it's also letting other voices speak into my life. And sometimes we don't have as much variety, but we try at Portland Pentecostals to have a variety of individuals come and speak because they just sound different when they say it. And, and I'm, I'm smart enough to know to put my ego down because I could teach on something many times and then an evangelist comes through and he teaches on it and somebody says, I've never heard that before. <laughs> now I know you are sleeping. Because it just doesn't, somehow it doesn't get through. I mean, we, you can listen to a song so many times and then all of a sudden hear the word. And here's a funny thing I'm telling my wife now. We can be in a store and she'll be humming along with the song. And I said, do you know what you're humming? What? Do you know what that song is? Oh, no, I didn't even know what I was humming. She just gets it in her brain. And uh, about a month ago, I said, uh, this is what that song is taught. I had no idea. <laughs> it was kind of fun. Good company. Is very important. You know, several of you have dealt with addictions in the past, and they told you that you had to separate from those people that were your dealers or the ones that you did drugs with in order to stay clean until you could be strong enough. And so some of you, God bless you, I honor you. you, you didn't go back to that neighborhood, you deleted voice messages, you deleted phone numbers, you blocked numbers. Why? Because you didn't want to go back to there. So good company is important, and sometimes a phone call is all we need. I use a phone call. When I lived in Canada, northern British Columbia, uh, the nearest church north was 50 miles. The nearest church south was 200 miles. And the furthest church in the section we fellowshiped in was 800 miles. And so we were a long ways from people a lot of times. Well, I'm a social being, and so everybody's different. So I knew myself that I could never get isolated. And somebody had told me one of the bad, bad things about living here is isolation. So I said, what am I going to do? I'm going to call somebody every week. And so I had a two or $300 long distance phone call. Yes, there used to be long distance phone call bills. Some of you guys that are under 25, Bobby, didn't even know that. That's a revelation to you tonight is that we had to pay in order to talk. But to me, the price was worth it because I knew myself 
that I had to stay connected. And so there's a couple of guys that I would rotate through and talk to. Well, the neat thing is, is that we became very close because of that. So you have to know yourself and say, oh, you know, maybe I just need to call this person because they always encourage me. Or I need to call this person. And so I know I have a friend. This is somebody that just loves me. And you don't have to dump on them. You just have to have a conversation. And you walk away saying, I feel better. Take them out to coffee. Do something. Engage with them. There's a, a few other things that I do in order to fill my bucket. I have pictures. You see my pictures on my desk. And that's Brandon and Tara and Kaylin and Melina and Brookie. And, and I look at those. And, and these are not inanimate objects to me. These stir up memories of things, of events, uh, of what's going on, uh, uh, of what they're saying. And, and I lock those away in my mind because I'm a very visual person. So if you're a very visual person, sometimes you can look at something and it just stirs up a whole sense of memories. And if, like, if you looked at my, my notes for one of my sermons and I should have put it up there, uh, there's all kinds of color in it and font changes. Because I'll know, okay, this time, you know, Christmas season, I'm using green and red, and I'm using these couple different fonts, and when there's an emphasis point, I do this. And sometimes I can just put a picture there, and it's a picture's worth a thousand words. It'll take me somewhere. So pictures of those that you love or, or with those that you love can be very, very important. I also have a bunch of thank you notes that people have sent me. And... A friend of mine that struggles with depression, I don't struggle with depression, but he struggles extremely with depression. He said, I'll tell you one of the things I did. <coughs> and he said, I have a folder. And every time somebody sends me a thank you letter or note, I put it in that folder. And if I'm having a bad day, I pull that folder out and I look through those notes. And I have memories. Uh, they can be so good. My, my stepmom passed away just a few months ago, but I... I used to tease her all the time. And I said, that box under the bed, mom, when you're not looking, I'm going to take it. It was all the love letters and cards that her and my dad had written to each other. And she said, oh, no, you're not. <laughs> and one time I, look, I said, I don't know where that went, mom, but while you were in the bathroom, that box disappeared. <laughs> um, and like, Two years before she passed away, I was visiting with her, and she said, uh, I said something about it, and she said, too late now. I threw it out. And I said, why? She said, every year on your dad and my anniversary, I would take all those cards and letters out, and I would read through it. And this year, I didn't cry, so I knew I'm good, and I threw them all away. So I'll never know what my dad said to my... <laughs> Thank God. Because <laughs> I have a box of those. Mementos. They're very, very important. Uh, you may not have noticed, but uh, I have this on my desk. Anybody that comes visits uh, occasionally, it shows itself. And it's a I love you heart. 1999, my daughter Brittany gave that to me on Valentine's Day. And I keep it there. I keep it there because I know she loves me and I keep it there to pray for her. So it, it's there as a memory and it, it stirs something. And it doesn't just stir one, one memory. It stirs a multiplicity of memories and, and good times. Uh, this was written by Brooke. It says, uh, Rose are red, violets blue, candy is sweet, so are you. Two. Love, Brooke. And so... In my office, you can see right on my, uh, some are tucked underneath, but right along the bottom edge of my monitor, I have notes like this that my grandkids give me. And there's some on my door, on the inside of my door, and they were on my desk, but Melina took them out and she's slapping them up there because she's measuring her growth <laughs> with one of the notes that she wrote with me. And things that wouldn't mean anything to anybody else, but... This is a little heart that was given to me on Valentine's Day by Abby when she was nine years old. And I keep it there. I, I have some root beer uh, lifesavers because my daughter gave those to me. 
I have a dollar bill that's sitting on my desk and it's kind of crumpled because one day uh, we were talking and I said, well, I would need a whole lot more money than that. I'd have to be rich. And Lincoln reached into his pocket and he pulled out that dollar bill and said, here, dad, here, Papa, that'll help. No, 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 you keep it. Uh, there's no way I can spend that dollar bill. It says something not just about his relationship with me, but him and who he is. And so those mementos are very important. Memories are very important. Whatever you need to do to feed yourself. So you've got to keep your bucket full. Why? So that you can fill everybody else's bucket. That's why we keep our bucket full. And we know how to fill our bucket. And we've got to take responsibility. And sometimes humor is one of the greatest th ways in order to fill our own buckets, to enjoy something. Now, me, I, I like to watch true crime. And then I've got to flush my mind. Anybody like to watch true crime? Oh, boy. Ooh, wow. Isn't that cool how they solve everything in like 60 seconds? Not in true crime. True crime is those ones where it's like, I, who's BTK? It's like, you know, all of these criminals come up after this uh, thing in Idaho came up and they're making references to and I'm going, who is that? Oh, yeah, I remember. Oh, no. How did he get away with that? I can't believe that. These, you know, then I've got to reverse it and go to the positive. My wife likes to watch humor. And she likes, she likes humor Slapstick humor, like when somebody falls and gets hurt. <laughs> there you are, huh? But here's what, so I'm not, I, what I'm trying to tell you is it's different for each, each of us. And there's a lady, I can't remember her name now, and she, has, she calls her husband left brain. Because he's so analytical that, you know, she's centered. She'll do something like, I sent him to the store for this because I was making uh, a lemon pound cake. And, and he comes back and he's got a whole trunk full of stuff because he misunderstood what she said because she's so analytical. And she tells these stories. And my wife can be sitting over there going, ah, 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 her earbuds in and I'm going, and so, sometimes I'll ask, are you watching that lady again? Yeah, I can tell who, but it feeds her because it allows her to disconnect from the problem solving of the world, her own problems, the weight of the world. And, and we need that time to fill our own bucket. So she's figured out what fills her own bucket. And even though we live in the same house, it doesn't, I like to watch them rebuild cars and I can watch them. Uh, Iron Resurrection or whoever, and it's like, man, I can't believe they did that with a car. And my wife, she could care less. I don't know what's wrong with her, but she could care less. <laughs> so these are things that I do to take care of myself. So the reason I'm telling the stories the way I am is I want you to think about what it is. Maybe it's working on the car. Maybe it's creating something. Maybe it's hunting. Maybe it's uh, uh, interacting with somebody on a, on a project. And, and it just feeds you. It fills you. And the beauty of that is, is that variety in our world and in the church is so good is that some people going, oh, man, I, oh, they're, they're bummed out because they have something they need to do and they can't do it and don't know how to do it. And somebody else in the church says, oh, I can do that. That's cool. I like doing that. I'll help you with that. And this is, really? You like busting your knuckles and getting grease under your fingers? Oh, whatever, go ahead, knock yourself out, do it. Oh yeah, it's fun. Okay, so you can call him when your oil needs changed. So, actually, <laughs> so, so I'm gonna take you to a few more scriptures. We've not yet read this in this Lately, do not err, my beloved brother. Every good and every perfect gift cometh down from the Father of lights in whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. That's probably my second favorite verse in the Bible. I remember that every good and perfect gift comes from God. That means you come from God. That means the things that I have and hold temporarily in my hands that are good come from God. The relationships and the interactions that I have come from God. And I have quoted that so many times that naturally I can be driving down the road and say, thank you for a reliable vehicle, Lord. 
I can walk into my home and say, thank you for my home, God. I can put on a pair of clothes and say, thank you, God, that they fit. <laughs> and my wife's saying, thinking, thank God the old ones don't. <laughs> so we have, it has created thankfulness in my heart. So what that, and that thankfulness in my heart and thinking has become expressive. And the more I express thanksgiving to God, the more aware I become of how good he is to me. And this is the crazy thing. Sometimes we want to categorize it or, or quantify it maybe is the be better terminology is that if it's really, really expensive, it's good. No, it's not about the price. It's not about a value somebody else places on it. But every good and every perfect gift cometh down from the Father of lights in whom there is no variable, there is not a shadow of turning. Now, first of all, all the good things come from him, and he doesn't change. There, there's no hint that he's going to change. There's no shadow of turning. <laughs> it's like, boy, I like that. That means if he's given me good things in the past... There's good things in my future. That means that if he's provided for me yesterday, he's going to provide for me today. And guess what? Life, life hasn't been just perfect, right? I mean, if we knew everybody's bank balances for the last 16 years, we'd, some of us, be embarrassed. You know, if we knew every mistake everybody made, we wouldn't be able to look at each other or we'd just sit around and laughing because why cry? But sometimes it's a matter of turning things into humor. And this is the beautiful thing about it is those mementos. Sometimes an almost or nearly catastrophic, catastrophic event can become humor later. You notice that? And it's, we, laugh, we laugh about having fallen down the stairs because we really didn't die. We, we, we laugh about things that we did that were like brain dead and we're embarrassed. You know, uh, several years ago, I tore my meniscus. I was putting all the Christmas lights up and my wife was gone to the cabin and I thought, I'm going to surprise her. It's a dry day. It's cold, but I'm going to put the Christmas lights up and it's 32 feet to the eave. So, and I don't have, a, my ladder is a uh, fiberglass ladder, so it weigh, it's tonnage. And I got it all done, and it's getting dark, and I'm walking around the back of the house, and I fell off the edge of the walkway and entangled myself in the, in the ladder. It's all right, you can laugh. I didn't die. <laughs> and the first thing I did was look around to make sure nobody saw. That's the important thing. <laughs> Isn't that really important, guys? It's like, <laughs> okay. Nobody saw, but I hurt for a couple years till God healed me. <laughs> but uh, things can become humorous. An example is, is that every time I get out my ladder to put up my lights, my neighbor eventually will come out or his wife will come out. And this year he came out and says, here I am. I said, Lori made you. Yes, Lori kept saying, go help Steve. Go help Steve. He's going to fall. Because about five years ago, John was working on a barn and he fell off a ladder and he, he limps today because of this, but he laughs about it now. And usually when I hear the door shut, I say, go ahead, video it. This is going to be spectacular. <laughs> so humor can be fun. And, 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 and when we get to the other side and we realize that things weren't as bad as we thought they were going to be, sometimes we breathe a sigh of relief. And humor does release something in us. Just like anger releases endorphins, humor releases endorphins. And so it's amazing how you can sit around and talk with people and laugh and you leave and, and you, you maybe can't even remember all the stories that were tell, told, but you feel better. And sometimes you laugh till you're crying. And you laugh because they're laughing. And you're laughing at them laughing. And it's all right. So 
We're going to end with a, a, a checklist, and we're just going to go quickly through it because I have given it to you to take home. And if you'll stand with me, uh, because really it is time to close down. It says, if you, if you want to get better at this, and here's the cool thing, is that if we get better at filling others' buckets and keeping our buckets full, you know, filling others' buckets can fill our buckets. Yeah. So here's a checklist, and, and there's 16 items on this checklist. And as you look through this checklist, you're going to find there's some things that you do naturally, and there's some things that you have learned to do, and there's some things that you do better than other things. And what I want us to do is focus on the things that we do well and say, okay, I'm going to keep doing those things because it's going to fill other people's buckets. And then when you're consciously aware that you're filling other people's buckets, that will fill your bucket. Does that make sense? Yeah. Is it, it's just like, okay, I'm doing good. This is, this is great. So have I helped somebody, someone in the last 24 hours? Am I exceptionally courteous person? I like being around positive people. I've praised someone in the last 24 hours. I, I developed a knack for making other people feel good. In the last 24 hours, I have some, told someone I care about him or her. I make it a point to become acquainted with people wherever I go. I receive recognition. When I receive recognition, it makes me want to give recognition to someone else. In the last week, I've listened to someone talk through his or her goals and ambitions, which we that feeds. These are all things that either feed ours or their buckets. Uh, I'm unhappy. I make unhappy people laugh. I make it a point to call each of my associates by the name he or she likes, not the pronoun. Uh, I notice that my colleagues, I notice what my colleagues do at a level of excellence. I always smile at people I meet and I feel good about giving praise whenever I see good behavior. And it's interesting, you know, you can do experiments and I've tried this is that seeing people. I, I was at, at a certain place uh, last week and I, I tried smiling at everybody that came in the door. Yeah. And it's amazing how different, uh, uh, you know, some of them was, you know, it took them by surprise. Some of them immediately, they smiled back. But it's that eye contact thing. And that's very, very important. And it makes for a good general living. So there's a checklist that I just wanted to give to you because that's just a practical thing that you could stick on your refrigerator or you can put it in your Bible or something and say, I'm going to work on this. I'm going to work on smiling at people that I meet. I'm going to work on meeting new people. Now, here's the beautiful thing about that is that I smiled at a lady in a store one time. It was in... Uh, uh, what is Lloyd Center and I was in there shopping and I smiled and said hello how are you doing and then I said uh, what part of New England are you from and she said how could you tell and I said come on man I said you got one of those Boston accents she said exactly where I'm from is Boston I said how would you end up out here and she told me her story and I said you like it out here she said yeah people are real friendly but they're lazy and <laughs> I said, what do you mean? She said, well, I worked 60 hours a week, plus I went to school. He said, she said, education is so important. And I said, well, I guess that's why you're a, a store clerk right now. <laughs> and she laughed. She said, you're right. We put so much emphasis on education, but what am I going to do with it when I'm all done? But I said, are there any comparisons you, you want to make? And she said, yeah, here's, here's a big, big difference. She said, we don't look anybody in the face, but you do. She said, I like that. She said, if we look people in the eye back there, they wonder what we're up to. <laughs> and she said, you will greet somebody with a hi or a hello or something or how you doing on the street. We would never do that. It's an East Coast, West Coast thing. I did it in Baltimore. It's a very different world. But it's amazing that people will respond to you if you... And so I decided this is not about me. It's about others. Making friends. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give this one last illustration and two scriptures and we'll be done. Is that my wife and I were at General Conference 13 years ago, I think it was. It was in St. Louis, Missouri. And we were at the headquarters hotel. It was the Marriott. And one of the, it was 
one of the easiest to access restaurants after church. And, you know, at 10 o'clock at night, where else do you go eat? So you go stand in line with everybody. And the line, you know, it feels like it's 15 miles long. And, uh, and talking to people that are sitting right there. It was the, and uh, there was a couple standing behind us in line. So I introduced myself. He was playing some kind of game on his phone. And, and I turned around and introduced myself to him. And then the conversation didn't go anywhere. So we just stayed in line. And when our table came up, the waitress took us to the table where it was a booth that you could see four people at. And I'm going, these guys could wait another 25 minutes. I said, do you mind if we go get somebody else out of line and bring them to our booth? And they said, no. So I went to that guy and I said, hey, we're... We just got sat down, and there's room for four or not just two at the table. You want to come sit with us? And he, he looked at his wife and said, Jen, what do you think? I said, no problem. So they came and sat with us. Well, here's the wild thing. We found out that her brother lived in Salem, Oregon. And Yvonne and I had been motorcycling with his in-laws. <laughs> and that I had worked with her father on North American Missions. And this guy was on North American Missions Administrative Committee. I think we're going on our 15th vacation together this week. <laughs> With that couple, Troy and Jennifer Fair. They pastor a thriving multicultural church that has nine different language group services on a Sunday in Sacramento. Because I smiled and introduced myself. I had no idea. I could have walked right by that and ended up not having a wonderful friendship that we have today. And so we can call and talk about God and church and all the spiritual things, or we can go on vacation and say, we're not solving any problems this week. We're just going to snorkel and we're going to eat lots of food and come back 10 pounds heavier. And <laughs> we're just going to, and we're going to laugh together. And she was the lady that I, when I preached my sermon on maintaining a positive attitude that fell off the raft into the water and started laughing. <laughs> So what I'm saying to you is those practices that I did, I had no idea where they would lead me, that they would lead me to a friendship that continuously fills my bucket. We've read the scripture and we're just going to briefly go over, you know, we, met, we read Psalm chapter number 23 where David, you know, he's in the presence of his enemies, my, surely my cup runneth over. But Hebrews 13 verses 5 and 6 says, let your contact Conduct be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have for he has said I will never leave you or forsake you part of maintaining a full bucket is not being greedy but learning to be content with what God has given us sometimes becoming content with what God has given us opens the door to even more than what we have and we would have never reached that something more unless we learned to be content with that. And then verse 6 goes on to say, So we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do unto me. So then verse number 8 is really a key to this. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Every good and every perfect gift cometh down from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of eternity turning hey my enemies are around me you prepare a table surely my cup runneth over surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life what I'm showing to you is there's scriptures if you'll learn those scriptures if you'll memorize those scriptures if you'll read the word if you'll study the word it'll fill your bucket and it'll keep others from stealing out of your bucket because you'll say no there's an authority right here that says I'm not going to listen to that Christian conspiracy theory I'm going to say, he's with me, he's given me good things, and he will never leave me. Lord Jesus, thank you for so many good things. Thank you for being consistently good to us. Thank you for your grace and your kindness and your mercy. Thank you for your love that has been made manifest in our midst. I pray that you would help me, help us to fill one another's buck buckets and the buckets of strangers around our city and community and wherever we go in the world so that we can impact our world positively so that you can work through 
through us uh, to make a better world and bring men and women to salvation. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.